Hi, everybody. I'm Sam Coffin with The Human Path, thehumanpath.com. Uh, I would like to talk about COVID-19 specifically and working with herbs. Uh, this is a huge subject. It's a huge subject that a lot of people are concerned with and talking about right now. Uh, first, really quickly, a disclaimer. I am not going, I am not uh, trying to treat or diagnose or do anything to step in the way of um, orthodox medicine treatment. So a licensed healthcare practitioner. I come from that background myself, former U.S. Special Forces medic, 18 Delta. That's where I first began back in 89. And I was interested in plant medicine back then to a great degree. And between that and now, whatever that's been 30, 31 years, I have been trying to be able to, to trying to integrate the worlds of herbalism in, and uh, our orthodox medicine, especially in the field, especially in austere settings. So we have two doctors on our, on our faculty at our school, uh, one an emergency medicine doctor who also started as a former U.S. Special Forces medic, and then a, a functional medicine doctor, a family practice functional medicine doctor who started in the military as well, a U.S. Army doc. And so my, you know, so I'm not here trying to tell you uh, that you need to use, that you can or should use herbs versus going to the doctor if you think that you are really sick, if you think you're sick with COVID-19. However, there are many other issues in play here. Number one, uh, we are on the verge of, have been on the verge of in certain places in this country of being completely overwhelmed in our, in our hospital care, in our uh, medical care, uh, being uh, risk of, of exposure. If you go to, you may not even be sick, you go to the ER for something else. So, you know, maybe you're going there because you have some other issue, a uh, chronic issue that you need to go there for and you end up getting infected um, and just overwhelmed uh, emergency medicine and uh, in intensive care medicine um, workers, right? They're, they're wonderful people who are overwhelmed. They're understaffed. Uh, they're undersupplied. They're undersupported. It's a horrible thing. We've got a lot of issues around this that are totally separate from the conversation I want to have on herbs. There's other people are having those conversations everywhere, and you can hear lots of good stuff there and bad stuff. Uh, but what I want to say here is just if you do feel you're getting sick, you know, you feel you are sick, the things to watch for, the things to be careful for that I'm not going to tell you to just sit down and take herbs for. Herbs are very wonderful for certain things. We can use them for a lot of holes and, um, you know, holes in the system, holes in our medical system. I think we can all agree there are many of those, right? There are many, and uh, it's a sieve in many places and herbs work very well to be able to catch a lot of those things. The problem is that most people don't know how to use them. There's a lot of ignorance, ignorance on the part of doctors, ignorance on the part of the public. And uh, so, but if you are feeling any of these red flags I have listed here, persistent chest pain, a heavy chest, pressure on the chest, shortness of breath, even when you're sitting down, you can't catch your breath, uh, signs of hypoxia, in other words, you're not getting enough, there's not enough perfusion of your tissue, uh, which could be, you know, a lot of times the brain is a huge oxygen hog, right? If the brain is not getting the oxygen it needs, there's going to be uh, confusion. There's going to be, uh, you know, sort of a lack of cognition. Uh, there may be cyanosis around the lips or even around the eyes, or you will see, see a you know, bluish tint to the skin, right? If you have a, um, if you can, can take, you know, your, your, and I would highly recommend, uh, you know, uh, taking and uh, checking your, your, um, your O2 sat, your saturation, um, if it's under 90, right? Or if it's just for a long, you can't get it over 94. Uh, these are things, these are red flags. Go to the doctor, right? Go to a licensed healthcare practitioner, nurse practitioner, or PA, or whoever it is you go to. Persistent fever. Fever is not a bad thing. We don't want to just stop a fever. And in fact, especially in a lot of times in viral infections, you want to have a fever. But if you're up around 104, it's time to consider going to higher care. Okay, so those are, that's sort of the, the um, disclaimer here, right? I'm not treating, I'm not diagnosing, but I am an herbalist. I've been working with herbs for 30 years, over 30 years. I started in 89 and uh, I have worked with thousands of clients just over the last decade alone, let alone the period of time when I was working as a special forces medic in troop medical clinics and ERs, et cetera, uh, and on the team. Uh, all of that added together, you know, it's, I have a lot of experience working with herbs and I have a lot of experience, especially working with herbs where I don't have a backup of anything else. I have an organization, we have an outreach organization as part of our school called Herbal Medics. We've been to places in remote Nicaragua where you're 100 miles from the nearest road. We've been to Mexico. We've been to some really badly underserved places in the United States where there is literally it's austere medicine. And that's, the, that's our pro, thehumanpath.com. Go check it out. Our austere medicine is, is kind of our centerpiece. That's what we do. We work with situations sort of like this 
but worse than this, but sort of the same idea where there's just not higher care available working with herbs, whether it's acute or whether it is uh, chronic care, right? So chronic care is what most people are familiar with. If you go to an herbalist, most herbalism in the US is kind of a first world, what I call first world herbalism where you know, auto-inflammatory conditions related to bad nutrition or, or, you know, a number of different issues around our, our bad food and all the toxins and all the stuff that we have going on in our first world environment right now. And there's a lot of that. But acute care would be more something like, like this, right? Like, uh, like COVID-19, a coronavirus outbreak, right? Like this. And so um, this is something where herbs can be remarkably, remarkably effective. Uh, there is a huge politics around, there's a huge amount of politics around the concept of healthcare, whether it's orthodox healthcare insurance and, uh, you know, in, in, the, um, in Washington, D.C., all of the different policies uh, down to state, down to local government, um, the entire sort of web of propaganda that has been laid over the idea of medicine starting back with the Flexner reports that came out in the 1910, uh, commissioned by the Carnegie Foundation to be able to uh, evaluate the type of medical schools that are out there and just really shut down any kind of medical education that wasn't pharmaceutical based. Uh, so pharmaceutical companies wrote the, you know, wrote the education, wrote the curriculum for that, right? Um, so the pharmaceutical experience versus a botanical medicine experience is that there it's difficult to find people who have worked with nothing but herbs. I'm saying not even, you know, even going away from nutrition and supplements, but just where you only have herbs to work with. And that's oftentimes where, where, you know, what I've had to do and what I've done uh, by choice in, in part of what we do, where we have to look to herbs to do these things. Now that said, Nutrition, lifestyle, all of the things that go into being healthy are the foundation of health. You have to have that. You can't just, in herbal, you know, herbalism is not pharmaceutical medicine by any stretch of the imagination. You can't have a person who smoked for 40 years and is 150 pounds overweight and has never exercised and never plans to exercise and eats horrible food. Uh, and, you know, whether they live in a food desert or whether it's by choice to eat horrible food, they've eaten fast food maybe by choice for the last 20 years. Uh, you're not going to give that person an herb to lower their blood pressure, right? If you could probably give them an herb. You could definitely give them an herb that might help lower their blood pressure, but that has nothing to do with what you should do or what, what you could reasonably expect to be expected to do. As opposed to pharmaceutical medicine that has actually made its money on giving a person like that a blood pressure medication and then another medication to be able to counteract or deal with the side effects of that blood pressure medication, where they might have three or four blood pressure related, related uh, medications. Okay, now, I'm not here to disparage pharmaceutical medicine. It might sound like I am, but I'm not. I just want to make sure that you understand there are differences between, there's a huge differences between a living botanical medicine versus a single constituent theory based concept around pharmaceutical medicine is based on fixing whatever a person comes in just like you're replacing a part of a car versus looking at the whole picture and so in this holism versus you know the the looking at the parts and, and kind of reductionism has been going on and people have been arguing and talking not talk, arguing but talking about that for like you know three or four decades since before i started into this right since before the you know the late 80s so back 70s 60s and and, and earlier uh it was part of a social social conversation somewhere in certain subgroups so we know that in herbal medicine we got to have that however now we're talking about something totally different now we're talking about an acute viral infection Okay, of the respiratory tract, the digestive tract, possibly even, you know, an encephalitis type uh, uh, situation, some, some, you know, swelling or in, possibly intracranial pressure, uh, things that are going on that we don't even really know. Um, and how can we work with those things using herbs, right? This is, this is acute care here we're talking about. And the question is, can we work with them? And the answer is, yeah, we can. We can absolutely help. What are our strategies? What are we trying to do here? If we are talking about acute care, uh, the cycle of, uh, that I would like to draw for you here is the prevention over here to begin with on the, on the left, uh, and then kind of the initial stages of infection. So prevention meaning you aren't infected yet and you're trying to do everything you can to take care of your body and your, your immune system. Now, we know that about 80% of people who get infected and have COVID-19 are, are going to be um, 
uh, have, have milder, well, what's, what's called milder symptoms. That can range from asymptomatic all the way up to, you know, being a really, really bad flu, uh, but not necessarily having to go into the hospital and, and, not, and not having to go into the ICU yet. But about 20% of people are needing that ICU care. They're needing higher care and ICU care, right? So what we're talking about with prevention is having a strong enough immune system, having a strong enough, and, and, you know, whether it's your innate immune system, your adaptive immune system, and those are not two uh, separate worlds, they're not in silos. Those two concepts of your immune system are very, very intertwined and work together a lot, very, you know, all the time. And there's nowhere in your body where you don't have an immune system, literally from the surface of your skin and bacteria that live there all the way to the deepest part of the inside of your gut or your heart or any place, any organ that you want to find. You have an immune system, a very active immune system. We can work with this and we can supplement this and we can actually strengthen this using herbs, okay, and lifestyle and nutrition, all those things, right? Excuse me. The initial stage is what we're talking about here is you might be feeling sick, you might not. You might have been in a place where somebody just coughed on you and, and you just, you feel like you might be getting sick or you might actually start to feel just like you're starting to get some symptoms here, right? And you don't know if you're being just a hypochondriac because it's really, am I really sick, am I not? Initial stages uh, and then, okay, we're sick. We are really sick. We are sick as heck. This is the sixth of Ben. Uh, I think it is definitely COVID-19. I am feeling all of these, you know, these symptoms. And what a lot of people get uh, that I've worked with, and I haven't worked with a lot. I've, I have a number of maybe 30 right now that I've worked with. And out of that 30, probably less, a little less than 10 that actually know for sure that they were you know, COVID-19 positive. Uh, and, and either because of testing or a doctor said, you definitely got it. I'm not even gonna waste time testing. You know, go home, come back. If, it, if, it, if you get this or this or this, go back to the red flags. And uh, so anyway, that's the peak. That's, you know, we got, we've got it. Or if we don't have it, we got something really similar to that. And that's okay because we can use herbs and work with herbs with something similar to that too. That's the beauty of herbs is we're really supporting body systems. More than anything, we're supporting the body, making it better at doing what it does. We're not just nuking and saying, hey, we got an antiviral. We got, we know that this, this uh, particular herb has a constituent and that this, you know, that's, that's going to be uh, an antiviral right? Quinine or whatever, uh, you know, it's an antiviral or, or you know, um, Artemisia, Ar Artemisia, or, um, you know, Artemisia Nua, um, um, uh, Sweet Annie. Uh, and try to use common names here. I've got botanical names as well, so I don't use common names enough anymore that I forget them. Uh, plants. But that's, you know, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to even in the, in the worst case scenario, we're trying to work with the body and help the body be much stronger at what it does maybe move through inflammation, move through inflammatory cycles. Uh, we know that the ACE2 receptors, for instance, in, the, in the type two pneumocytes, and we know that ACE2 receptors in the gut are a big part of this issue. Can we strengthen that? Can we, uh, can we do some things that are going to help our body at that level, at the cellular level? And the answer is yes, we are, and we can with herbs. And then recovery. Now we're back on the recovery track, uh, and I, I, or track, and we want to be able to make sure we don't get sick again. And that is probably something we need to be thinking about is recurrence. That's something that, you know, it seems like you don't really know who you can believe, but there are definitely reports that seem believable that there is recurrence going on right now in China and Wuhan. And is that something that we're going to be seeing in September, October, November here? And if we do, how bad is that? You know, how bad is any of this really? I mean, here's the thing. If everybody stayed at home and used herbs the same way that I do, this wouldn't even be an issue. I'm, you know, I'm going to tell you that. This is... <laughs> I have no fear whatsoever, you know, and you, yeah, maybe I'll eat those words. I doubt it. Highly doubt it. I have no fear whatsoever of being sick. The only fear I have is infecting somebody. We have somebody who lives here who's my, my mother-in-law who's highly respiratory compromised. You know, she has had asthma her whole life and she is, she could be very easily, you know, very easily infected if we're not careful. That would be my fear is infecting somebody who's, who's, you know, immune or respiratory compromised. So of course I need to be responsible as I can, as much as I possibly can. And I am, uh, and you know, but so we're doing all of that. But for me personally, I bring it on, you know, honestly, 
bring it on. I'm, I have no fear at all. I have formulas for this. I have protocols for this. I've been working with, with other people on this, uh, you know, with clients and people who've asked for help on this that uh, I have, um, have been having amazing results with. And of course, the numbers still need to come in. And there will be. There'll be a lot more numbers than I have right now. And uh, we'll see. And of course, it's a moving picture. It's a moving target. Okay, back to prevention. When we come to this full circle, we're still back to prevention. We still don't want to get sick again. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the herbs. That's probably why you're, you're watching this because you want the herbs. So here's some different goals that we have. We want to, let's just start over here with prevention. We want to support an innate immunity, right? Support adaptive immunity and support eliminative processes. So let me explain what that means. Let me go into it. So innate immunity, what are some of the herbs that do this and why and what are they doing here? And, I'm, and this is a 10,000 foot view. I'm moving through pretty quickly, but... Um, but this, you know, but, but hopefully you'll get, get some ideas from what I'm talking about. The innate immunity, who we're talking about macrophages, for instance, neutrophils, we're talking about that part of our immune system that doesn't have a target other than knowing self from non-self. It's the part of our immunity we share with all vertebrates, basically. If something comes into our body and doesn't belong, it's either, it either does belong or it doesn't, basically. Um, that's what our innate immunity does. But our innate immunity does a lot of other things, too. It's a very important signaling part of our immune system. So um, one thing that we can do is we can, um, we can support that. So how, does, how do we support it and what does that look like? Echinacea raises our, our, our macrophage count, raises our neutrophil count, raises their, their activity. Self-heal spike, same thing. All of these herbs, self-heal spike, astragalus, andrographis are going to, are going to increase the um, number and the activity of the, our, our innate immune system. Other things that do that that aren't herbal, for instance, would be, um, would be uh, hot, like heating your body. The fever, our feet, when we get a fever, it's going to do that. Well, sitting in a sauna is going to do that. Hot and cold stuff is going to do that. We, we're, I'm not going to go through a whole bunch of the healthy stuff that everybody else has out there. There's, there's lots of places, whether it's you know, Tai Chi or Qigong or, or, or Wim Hof uh, breathing or hot and, and cold, you know, ba baths, all that kind of stuff. Those are great things, but they're not herbs. And, and I'm here to talk about herbs because not very many people are. Most people are talking about that stuff. This the safe stuff that, you know, you can say to anybody, nobody really knows or works with herbs on an acute level all the time. And so that's what I do. And that's what I want to talk about because that's what I can share and hopefully help you with. So here are some, these are not all, none of these herbs are, are none of these lists are by any stretch of the imagination complete. I have over 350 herbs here behind me and uh, there is a huge spectrum of overlap across many herbs for many different body systems and many different uses. The key is in learning to formulate. The key is in learning to make medicine out of them and what kind of medicine to make, you know, tinctures and glycerites and different kinds of extracts and, and you know, trying to get really good clinical potency out of what you make. And so, as you can see, herbalism is a huge art and science, right? I mean, you have to be able to do so many things, you identify plants and make medicine and you have to be able to, you know, do clinical intake and understand what that's about and how to, you know, assess what's in front of you and work with that. And you have to be able to work with a person, you know, um, face to face and help them and follow up with them. Um, you have to know something about physiology and anatomy and nutrition and, um, and all of these things and chemistry and plant chemistry and botany. And so there's so much that goes into this. So my point to that is, sorry, it was a long tangent there, is that, um, these four herbs are by no means the only herbs that are going to help support innate immunity. And look, we actually have them repeating, two of them repeating down here, astragalus and andrographis we find down here, because they both do support both the innate and the adaptive immunity. And in ways, echinacea does too, and in ways, self heal spike does too, because if we're supporting the innate immunity, we're supporting cell signaling that has to happen in order for any of these number of processes to go, whether you have a wound or you sprained your ankle and it's healing or you tore, you know, tore some cartilage or you're infected with a virus, there is a series of healing steps that have to go on that include inflammation, they include proliferation, they include the ability of, of, the, of the body to perfuse tissue, to be able to get out waste products and toxins and to be able to, to heal. And in fact, this is a big thing with COVID-19 is waste products and, and, and issues that can happen with those 20% and, and, and even a, a micro, or I'm sorry, a smaller percentage, a sub percentage of those 20% that can get really sick and die is a lot is related to this is clearing out toxins out of the alveoli for instance how do we do that 
how do we get that that fluid out of there you know too or how do we make sure that there's enough uh, perfusion across the, the capillary beds across you know the alveolar, alveolar uh, capillaries right all of those things play a role okay now adaptive immunity this is where we're supporting the part of our immunity that is uh, you know is is our memory right our, our, our um, immunity memory or memory of our immune system right antibodies that are formed to be able to say hey this is something we've seen before this is the whole concept behind vaccines for instance uh, this is something we've had before this is something we've seen before one way or another with a vaccine or we've had the illness before and it hasn't mutated enough to where we recognize it and we can deal with it and so some of the herbs that help us with that especially going forward are in kind of the preventative mode here where we're talking about just making sure we're, we're, our, our immune system's up and good is astragalus neem elder andrographis those are all really good ones okay and then if we are going to move our immunity or, or increase our immunity, we also need to increase our eliminative processes because if our immune system's working great and better, then we need to be able to move our lymph. We need to be able to um, detoxify through our liver. We need to be able to eliminate through our urinary tract and our liver and our skin and our respiratory tract too, all of the places that we eliminate uh, waste out of. Right, and so some of these herbs are really good eliminative type herbs, and this plays a really big role in keeping us healthy as well. So dandelion root in particular here, very good liver support herb and very good detoxification supporter, very gentle. Uh, red clover also, gentle lymph mover. Uh, another one that is not here that a lot of people use is cleavers. And I kind of equate red clover and cleavers. I prefer red clover for other reasons, but it, they're, they're, they're similar in a lot of ways. Celery seed, also a good eliminative herb. Right, a good urinary tract herb, but it's also a great respiratory tract herb. It's help, it helps clear out waste, really, is what it does, and, and even lymph. And then the prickly ash is one of my favorites for helping move the lymph. It does a lot of other things, too. Arguably, could be called, quote, unquote, antiviral in a lot of situations, uh, and maybe it is. Uh, but it's certainly, from the standpoint of how it supports tissue, so indirectly, it certainly is antiviral. Uh, now, these are herbs that we could take. We could, move, we could take a couple of, of herbs from an innate immunity uh, column and a couple from adaptive and a couple from the eliminative process, and we could make a formula. And I highly recommend that if you're taking herbs that you do formulate. Here we go. A whole other subject. I could literally, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this talk as brief as I can. And yet you're going to see so many rabbit holes off of this that we could talk about. I could literally, and I do, we have a 12 uh, hour or 15, 16 hour or course on just nothing but formulation. And it's really an advanced level course. You have to take some other courses just to get to the point where you really understand it. You don't have to, but you don't want to because you're going to, otherwise you'd be over your head. So you can see all of the pieces that go into this is it's a lot easier than it's not a matter of just saying hey just go take an herb and go buy you know go buy this encapsulated herb that you're going to get at aisle 13 of your local grocery store that's the health food section uh it's probably the worst thing you could do and the worst way to do it and i don't mean to sound you know like i'm talking over anybody's head here or condescending or anything like that but just know that there's a lot going into this uh, herbalism is a way for people to be able to take medicine into their own hands, <clears throat> but it is still medicine. And there's a responsibility that goes along with this. You have to be aware on a lot of different levels. You have to be able to kind of move in slowly, you know, piece by piece, working with yourself and saying, okay, do a little bit of reading, do a little bit of study, go to some classes, go to a school, you know, go to a program, go to one of our programs, whatever, and then get a lot more confident in what you're doing and understand all these pieces and put them together. That's the whole point of, you know, why I have a school is to be able to help people with things that took me a long time to put together because I did it on my own. I didn't like anybody else's input. Uh, really, I never, other than, you know, some different, a few different books. And so putting it all together took me a long time. And I try to have all of that, you know, put down into, into a way that we can do it quickly for people. All right, now we're moving on. We weren't, we didn't protect, for one reason or another, we got infected, we're in initial stages. Support respiratory health, digestive health, and respond to the symptom, you know, the symptoms. So this, so the symptom picture or the symptomology um, or, you know, the differentiation of syndromes, as they would say in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, how do we do that? Oh my goodness, this isn't coming up very well, but you can see support respiratory health over here, support digestive health here, and the respond to symptom picture. So the white kind of bled out there. I should have had it a different color. Here are some different respiratory herbs that you can use early on and late on in this, in this situation. You don't have, don't, it's not necessarily limited to just these, but herbs to throw into your Materia Medica. That's the herbs that you use, the Materia Medica, uh, it's your, you know, it's your medicine shelf of all your different herbs, right? 
uh, you should have a materia medica that's always growing, right? I started out with probably two or three or half a dozen. And um, the first experience I really had was to work with a broken thumb in the middle of what's called Goat Lab in, in um, 18 Delta School. And uh, I did. And now it's like, that's one of my little big personal stories as to how I made that joint transition into really being comfortable and confident with herbs was working with a broken thumb when I had to be able to make it. I had to be able to perform to be able to get through that course, which was a grueling, grueling, it's the most grueling course I've ever been through. And I had a broken th thumb during that. And there were two herbs that really helped me with that. That not just helped, they, they healed my, I mean, I, there was the, the trial by fire. It's like, oh my God, these herbs work and they work incredibly well. So uh, this is what I, you know, so I started out, you know, knowing those two herbs were really well and then it grew, you know, and then by a year from then, I probably knew 20 herbs really well and so forth. Okay, so the, here we got, you know, whatever this is, about 12 herbs or so, but these are all really good herbs up here for the respiratory tract to support the respiratory set tract in different phases of what might be going on. Most of these would be great for, <clears throat> for that initial dry cough. The thyme helps protect the cilia, for instance. So the cilia may be damaged by this virus is one of the, is one thing, theory that's out there. And so uh, the thyme has been shown in different studies to be able to protect the, uh, the, the beating that you know that the, the, the cilia do those are the hairs in our respiratory tract and they beat in a rhythm together and so for instance um you know whooping cough uh is attacks the the <clears throat> the uh the epithelial cells that um, the, and, and attacks the cilia's ability to do that and for instance and so that's why you end up with this you know this horrible cough because you can't get the, you know, a child, for instance, you know, ends up coughing and coughing and coughing until they either pass out or they throw up or they have to, you know, take a breath and they give that whooping sound, um, which is where they came from. Well, that's a cilia problem. So time is a good herb to know for that. A really good herb to know and have in your, in your, and it's so common, right? It's in your kitchen. Now the kitchen spice that you buy from the, from the store may not really be very strong, very good clinical potency, but uh, you can get time easily. You can grow it. You can just grow it in your garden. It grows easy. You can grow it on your kitchen window, right? Yerba Santa is one of my favorites for opening up the respiratory tract. It's so good at doing that. Lobelia is great, especially for allergic type related stuff. Marshmallow is one of those, especially for a dry cough where we're really wetting down. We're using these uh, hydropolysaccharides in the, in the root and the leaf that are going to really help with that dryness and help the mucosa. And the, the mucin that's in our, in our respiratory tract is critical for being able to move these you know, particles of dust and, and uh, you know, these fo little micro microscopic fulmites that viruses are going to be uh, a, a part of as you breathe them in and then they're going to eventually attach themselves to these you know, to, the, to our um, respiratory epithelial cells. And, and then from there, we know what happens or we think we know. Lizard's tail is, is a more, it comes from, from, from TCM, but it grows here in the US. <clears throat> Hotunia cordata, incredible anti-inflammatory and a great respiratory herb. Yerba monza is it's good for so many things. Yerba monza is an amazing herb. Uh, you can use the leaf or the root. A lot of people, you know, just use the root, but I, I tend to use the leaf. I try to take care of it. It's one of those herbs that really needs human care. We don't, we want to need to be careful with it. It could be at risk very easily if a lot of people, you know, we're just digging it up for the root. You have to, you have to be very responsible with your Vermonsa. And then for the, the, the digestive tract. So again, remember our ACE2 receptors in our digestive and our respiratory tract. So if some people start this off with diarrhea and nausea and vomiting. Uh, and so if, we got, if we've got those symptoms, we're responding to those symptoms of that symptom picture, we want to use something with berberine in it. So that could be golden seal or more commonly any of the barberry or the, the berberis or mahonia species. So Oregon grape. Bar, here we use algorita or sometimes called desert barberry, algorita trifoliolata. <clears throat> so these are, I'm sorry, berberis trifoliolata. Uh, these are herbs that we that are really, really good at soothing the inflammation in the gut. And they're, they are probably have a, a specifically an antiviral component in the sense that that they, that they help the gut, they help our own immune system and the gut deal with this. Artichoke leaf is a ACE2 inhibitor. Um, I use it for nausea sometimes along with the algorita leaf. Uh, very good for inflammation of the gut as well. Milk thistle supports the liver. Plantain supports the liver. Alcubin is one of the constituents in there that does that very well. Dandelion root again. Here we go again, right? Just a great low toxicity, gentle herb that we can use for the lymph and the liver. Burdock root, also lymph and liver. And then Canadian fleabane is one of those, it's just an interesting herb. And it's a roadside weed everywhere in the U.S. Everywhere in the U.S. you're going to see it on the road practically. Uh, it's everywhere. And, and during the, you know, from spring until late summer. This is an herb that is um, an incredible 
hemostatic and very, very astringent. It tastes almost like a mustard. It's got a spicy mustard taste if you taste the leaf, but it's very good for, uh, for helping stop um, bleeding, helping stop, in, you know, even if I didn't have anything else to use, this would be my um, herb that I would probably use for internal bleeding if I had to, right? Uh, ulcerative colitis, I've used it for, for instance, and it's, it works. It's, it's a great, I've used it for nosebleeds, taking it internally for, for chronic nosebleeds that won't stop even, and I've seen it work for that. Uh, but here we're talking about something like diarrhea, where we're just trying to slow down the diarrhea in this case, right? This would be a good herb for that, as well as having a good astringing, you know, uh, effect on the, on the gut itself. Okay, let's move down here to peak. Okay, we've hit. Now we're at peak, uh, you know, really feeling, uh, you know, we're, oops, sorry, come back in here. We're really feeling it, right? We're really sick. Well, same thing. We're still going to try to, uh, you know, continue to support those initial stages. So any of those herbs that were up in, that, in the initial stages that we just talked about are going to work here as well. But uh, let's add in a few that are both probably have some uh, directly antiviral com uh, components to them. Feverfew, for instance, being one of them, possibly. So feverfew contains melatonin. Uh, probably the relationship, a lot, it, you know, it's a pretty high in melatonin as far as, uh, you know, compared to most plants. It's one of the higher contain melatonin-containing plants there is. Uh, it is also an incredible pain reliever and an incredible anti-inflammatory. I use it for a lot of things. It's also the parthenolizer, very antiviral, directly antiviral for herpes family viruses. I use it in a lot of herp herpes, um, herpes family uh, virus type stuff like um, shingles and, and HSV1 and 2. Along together, I use it also with Chaparral, which is down here now. Chaparral, I meant to put a star by, so I'm jumping here from Feverfew all the way down here to Chaparral. I don't know if you can see my pointer or not. Uh, it's the first time I've tried using this, this app. Um, but the Chaparral, uh, Luria tridentata usually, is uh, a drop-wise dosage. This is something you take in very small dosages. Now, I wanted to say also another way that we can administer most of these herbs is through a steam inhalation. Okay, so uh, putting them in, just like you're making a, a pot of tea, so you put, in, put the herbs, put a couple of, um, maybe three tablespoons of an herb mixture, uh, it can be even more, it can be as much as a cup, you know, of an herb mixture into a pan and then pour about, you know, three cups in on top of that and let it sit and soak for a little bit, stir it up, put a towel over your head and just, you know, try to hold all that steam in. You can put a towel over the pot and then just, just inhale that steam. You know, that's another way to do it. Of course, you know, nebulizer is a possible way. Uh, there's some controversy around using nebulizers in COVID-19 that we'll stay away from for right now. And, uh, but it is normally, for other things, I use nebulized uh, tinctures and nebulized decoctions to be able to deliver, especially to, label, to, to deliver sometimes constituents directly to the bloodstream across the alveolar membrane versus trying to get them through the gut when there's really no absorption across that, you know, brush border of the gut. So, Anyway, back down here to thing to feverfew. Pleurisy root is another one of my favorites for deep stuff. So, you know, it's called pleurisy root because it used to be used traditionally for pleuritis, right? So, so this inflammation of the, of the pleura itself, of the membrane, the, 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 we have you know, two faces of that membrane around our lungs, right? Uh, the visceral and parietal pleura, they come together and, um, are, and, and stick together. That area can get very, um, can get uh, uh, inflamed. You know, if we were to have, for instance, a, a pneumothorax, if we got a gunshot wound or a knife stab to the chest and there was air inside that, it's that, it's that pleural cavity that we're talking about with the two, you know, with the two uh, faces of our pleural membrane. If that area gets inflamed or used to get inflamed, pleuritis uh, was, a, was not an uncommon uh, thing to encounter in, in you know, uh, go back about 100, 150 years, different sets of diseases, different epidemiologies in a, in, in a nation that we were then versus what we are now. Uh, and so pleurisy root was used a lot for that. And I love to use this herb for deep respiratory distress, inflammation, and for, it's an, in my opinion, it's one of the best relaxing expectorants in North America. I love this plant. Love it. So, um, and, you, and it's butterfly weed, right? It's also called. This is one to take care of too. If you're going to use it, you got to use the roots. You got to kill the plant for it. Plant another one. And it's an incredible uh, plant for all of our different pollinators, right? It's an amazing plant to have for the monarch butterflies and, and so forth. And it's, um, it's this one that you really want to have around. It's beautiful too. It's a beautiful plant. Uh, grow it in your gardens. And then, you know, if you're going to grow it for yourself or you're going to buy it online or whatever, try to take the responsibility of, of growing it somewhere too. If you're using the plant, replace the plant. This is part of the living medicine of herbalism that is far different than pharmaceutical medicine. This is the medicine that our species has been using for probably a million years or who knows how long we've been occupying this planet. But 
it's just the last century is a blip on the, a blip, a blink of the eye. So we think it's reality right now. It's not reality. I got news for you. What we think is medical reality right now is not medical reality. And we're seeing that right now. We're seeing it break down. This is not bad it, by any means. It could be much, much worse. But, you know, approaching real crisis level, and this is where I, you know, this is where I kind of make my money. This is what I love to think about, work about, and, and how we can create our programs from didactic to hands-on to scenario-based to real world through our outreach program, uh, creating these situations to be able to get people to start thinking in regards to what is reality versus what do we all just kind of agree upon as a, you know, mutually agreed upon hallucination, you know, paper money and healthcare system and insurance and all these things that aren't really real. If they go away, this is what we've got. This is herbs are what we've got. And this is what we've always had. They're not going anywhere unless we destroy our planet. So you've got to be part of that. You have to love the planet and have that relationship of love with the planet and your, and these plants you use, if you really want to understand them, if you don't have that, if you're just going to use it like pharmaceutical medicine, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. listening to me. I like, like Joe Biden, go vote for Trump. You know I mean? It's like literally, but I, you know, I'm, sorry. And now I got to go gargle with bleach for saying two names there. But, but, but really what I'm saying is you have to understand that this is a medicine that is alive and you're working with a, you're working with plants that we literally perform mouth to mouth resuscitation with via the carbon cycle, every breath. Okay. If you don't want to do that, and that doesn't mean anything to you at all, and you just want to go dig a plant out, or better yet, just go buy a plant and have no thought at all about what you're actually doing, then you're creating a problem there instead of creating a solution. Okay. So the solution is given to you by this plant. You need to give a solution back to the plant. That's the way it works. If you don't do that, you're never going to be any good at this. And if you don't ever want to be any good at that, that's fine. But if you do want to be any good at that, please think about life that way, the cycle of life, okay? Goldenrod, incredible for support, of course, of, of allergies and inflammation of the lungs. Here we're talking about deep inflammation, right? These type two pneumocytes that may be really inflamed. We maybe have the alveolar, um, the alveoli that are, that are filled with fluid or filled with junk, uh, or, or we may have a different type now they're talking about where we just don't have the perfusion. We actually have the alveoli are able to, to open. They're not filled, but we don't have the perfusion for some reason. And I'm seeing some stuff like that too, some weird stuff that's going on that would maybe lend credence to the theory that the virus may attack the hemoglobin in the bloodstream. I don't want to say if it does or not. I don't know. I'm just saying I'm seeing things that could be explained that way, you know. So anyway, sidetracked here. But inflammation was my point. And goldenrod is excellent, especially the root. But most people use the aerial parts for this. Red sage also for inflammation and also for increasing the, the uh, vascularity around the area. And it's probably a directly, and it has at least indirect antiviral uh, components here. Bicol skullcap, we're using the root of that. And we could use the skullcap Latura flora if we could get the root, but you're going to have to grow it or find it in the wild to do that because you're not going to be able to buy the root online. <clears throat> the only root you're going to get online is the Bicol skullcap, the Scularia bicolensis, which comes to us from Chinese medicine, right? Now, this has Bicolin, Bicolin in it, and that's probably arguably one of the big major constituents in this working here. And um, that's great because it goes across, it moves across, we can get absorption in the bloodstream very easily of it. Uh, and it is so useful for so many types of inflammation. I love to use this plant. The Bicol Skullcap is one of my mainstay herbs for any kind of, of inflammation of the, of the respiratory tract. Uh, it's also one of my mainstays for, for biofilm infections uh, as a biofilm buster and a quorum sensing inhibitor. It is an incredible herb, right? Citrus peel. I've been having some interesting you know, there was this whole thing with the spiridine and, and citrus. And I don't know if that's what it is, if that's constituent, but I'm having some really positive uh, effects and, and with a couple of people now uh, using citrus peel, okay? Japanese knotweed definitely, you know, has it's kind of uh, gone around as an antiviral for quite a while. There's a lot of thought about that. So Imodin and resveratrol are two of the big, big components in there that are probably antiviral for, for a coronavirus. Excuse me, I need to drink some water. Wild cherry bark. At this point, where the lungs are heavy and there's a lot of a lot of uh, inflammation in there, I, I would consider prunus serotina here. I would totally consider that. This is one of those two that the medicine making component makes a difference. 
you need to know how to make medicine out of this. It includes a cold water infusion. It's a multifractional extraction is what you really want on this. So whole nother tangent, whole nother rabbit hole. Gumweed, I love this plant. It's a roadside weed all throughout the Southwest, right? It grows here in Central Texas too, but I'm used to it from Colorado, being and, you know, from Colorado originally myself. Chaparral, I mentioned before, this is a dropwise dosage herb, but it's incredibly effective both as an in, in a steam inhalation from what I've seen so far. Just uh, two clients uh, related who had incredible results using this, and I can't wait to try to use it again. Uh, both taking it orally, just like five drops of it orally, but also inhaling it like just breaking up that congestion just immediately, like within minutes, just getting rid of it and coughing, like coughing up a hairball of, of you know, phlegm from the chaparral, which is very interesting, right? This is another I mentioned that, you know, it's a very strong antiviral directly for our herpes family viruses, for instance. A perillacy, this is a mint family that we find um, that is uh, uh, really, it's used a lot, again, it comes as mostly from Chinese medicine as well, as a respiratory, helping break up, again, break up this, you know, congestion. Ellie Campaign, I love this plant for this congestion and breaking up congestion. It is amazing. Uh, and it's also have found this, the Ellie Campaign, the citrus peel, and the Baikal skullcap uh, applied across the nasal membrane, the nose, as in what's called a nausea oil. Not, not nausea as in sick, but N-A-S-Y-A, -A, coming to us from Ayurvedic medicine, uh, an oil that you can, you can make. So you infuse the, the herbs in you know, heated oil, and then you uh, strain it, and then you can use that oil and put it in the nose. And uh, I'm not going to demonstrate and stick my finger in my nose in front of you here, but basically rubbing that, that membrane, uh, rubbing that oil in the membrane, you know, a few drops of it at a time, and uh, finding immediate relief, very quick relief uh, from really bad headaches that really, uh, to me, seem like kind of hypoxia-induced um, pulmonary edema the way you might see hate, like high-altitude pulmonary edema or something. Is it hypoxia-induced? Is it, you know, and why? And, and is this land again credence maybe to the theory of the hemoglobin being attacked or is that complete bunk? I don't know. I just know what I've seen is that definitely sort of that ICP, that, that intracranial pressure thing, where if a person pushes back and forth like this, pushes here, the pressure goes away, the headache goes away. If they start pushing straight down on their head, the headache becomes intense. This is, these are things that would indicate to us that there's some, there's some you know, encephalitis going on, there's some inflammation, there's some swelling and fluid in there that's causing that headache. And here again, our Ellie campaign, our Japanese knotweed even, but especially our Baikal skullcap and our citrus peel are going to be things to consider here intranasally, okay? All right, we're almost done here. Let's just talk briefly about recovery, respiratory health. You're gonna see the same ones we were talking about before. We had mullen in here. I love mullen, it's a great plant. And I use the root probably more than I do the leaf honestly, for different, for, for different uses, for urinary tract and for cystitis. But the leaf is incredible and the, and the flower is incredible for the you know, respiratory tract. And it's just a really good kind of respiratory support strengthener. It's a great herb. It's a wonderful herb, right? And it's just, it's of course, again, another roadside weed all around the U.S. Panax ginseng, I and mean, when you think of ginseng as like the energy plant and so forth, American ginseng in particular is the one that I use. Uh, but it's a really good relaxing spectrum, very, very soothing to the lungs, very, very good for the respiratory tract. And then angelica, with this could include the uh, Dong Kuai, the angelica sinensis uh, from Chinese medicine, or our angelica, our arch angelica here in the U.S. is really good kind of a heating expectorant, very good support herb for respiratory health as well. Also a little bit of a lymph mover in my opinion. Then rest and stress support. So there's literally probably dozens, if not hundreds of herbs that can go into stress support, what we call nervines. But here's a few good ones. Skull caps of your ginseng, holy basil, uh, depending on which uh, species you want to use. And then ashwagandha with somnifera. With somnifera also was good for inflammation uh, that for something to, to use in the nausea oil that I was talking about before. I would consider that back with that with those other herbs too. Um, and then nutritive, we just want to tonify and nourish the body, parsley root, red clover, nettles, astragalus, all of these, again, very nourishing, very tonifying, and are going to help with our, with our, you know, giving our body the support that it needs. There are many, many others of our tonifying and sort of our, our tonic herbs that comes to us, that concept comes to us from energetic medicine, whether traditional Greek or traditional Chinese or Ayurvedic medicine, but we find these like Codenopsis would be another one that would fit in here, for instance, that are these good tonic herbs just, you know, that you can take long term that are going to give you uh, good, you know, support tonification and also some elimination in the case of like parsley root and red clover. Um, these are all uh, what we would call aqua, aquaretics, not, not diuretics, 
but really aquaretics. In other words, increasing circulation through the kidney and, and we, we excrete more, we eliminate more. Okay, I think that's all of them. Uh, if you want any more info, Human Path, the humanpath.net or .com, either one. If you want my book, if you want to check out my book, um, it's, I'll have a new one coming out through Story Publishing in about a year. So if you want the, the one I have out now, it's got a lot of this type of information in it. And that's at herbalfirstaidgear.com. You'll find other things there as well that maybe we've talked about. Uh, social media, check us out anywhere there. The, you just look for the Human Path or Herbal Medic. Uh, Urban Minded Community page is, is actually a group, it's not a page, and uh, that's a really big group. And there's a lot of good conversations going on about uh, herbal medicine there. So I highly recommend checking that out. Or just follow me on, on I, you know, I'm usually right around, bouncing around my 5,000 friend limit, but just follow me. I'm always trying to put stuff out there. And I don't get onto Instagram as much as I should. It's, um, I don't have it here, but it's basically um, at um, Herbal Medic Sam. So Herbal Medic Sam on Instagram. Uh, but I, you know, and I'll try to get back to that, but I just, uh, you know, I'm, it's like, I've been putting most of my stuff in Facebook, I guess. I'm, I'm like right on the line between next gen uh, generation or generation X rather and boomer. So, you know, I'm kind of doing the Facebook boomer thing rather than the <laughs> generation X Instagram thing, maybe. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I like Facebook better because it's better, easier to copy and paste and throw videos in there and they don't have so much time limit stuff. And so I like to put stuff that's longer like this on there. So thanks for watching this. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you got something out of it. Uh, feel free to check in there in any of those places and ask questions if you want to. I try to get back to people when I can. And uh, we're really busy a lot of time, but I'll try to get back to you. All right, take care.